All right, so for those of you who don't know me, I'm Lucas Zugwitz. I'm the snow hydrologist for the Montana Snow Survey. Um, technically, my title is water supply specialist. It'll work eventually, I think, here. Um, so I work for the snow survey. We cover the snow tail sites in Montana, Wyoming, and South Dakota. Pretty big area. We have two employees in here. I know Shalane works for Big Sky. He works for us in the summer. And Eric Larson, who's also in the back, um, is kind of here to answer some questions as well. I'm going to have to bail uh, pretty quickly here after I get done with this. But um, Doug titled this, The Nuts and Bolts of Snow Tail. Uh, my wife was laughing that that second word in there. She said, you didn't put another vulgar phrase in this talk for the folks that you're talking to? <laughs> like, oh, I can do way better than Doug's title, but I didn't. So I just want to kind of give you the mechanics of snow tail and kind of let you understand uh, a little bit more about it, maybe in depth. And we can kind of cater it however folks want to go in this room. Well, how many of you use snow tail data on a normal basis? So a lot of you. So you're kind of pros. I figured um, that'd be the kind of target level that I have here. I have some pretty simple slides, but we'll kind of go through and let you know kind of what we do from our perspective and kind of how big our network has gotten and how big it might get. So uh, I think we're the best tax dollar um, that you could actually get out of it. Um, each one of our weather stations costs a significant amount of money to maintain. It takes us about five months during the summer to maintain all of our weather stations. And that doesn't include all the sites that we have to visit in the winter and all the snow courses that we measure. So the, the reason that our program started was for ag water forecasting. It wasn't for these kind of recreational subgroups that we're kind of getting now because the data is readily available. It's great that you can go and grab snow depth, sweep, precip. This program in Montana started in 1922. So we're coming up pretty close on 100 years of measurements across our state. So it's a long-term record. And the snow tail system really didn't come online until about 1965. And the first actual snow tail radio system we had was at Lake Creek right up here in High Light. So that's where it all started. It actually started as a collaborative effort with the engineering department of Montana State. So really interesting. We have deep roots here in Bozeman uh, and that's kind of where it started for us. So we kind of started snow tail here. Uh, we're really proud of it and we work really hard to maintain it. If you look across the west though, there's 862 snow tail sites in 14 western states. So it's a huge network that includes Alaska. Uh, we have 26 snow light sites is something we're kind of playing with here too, snow light. So a snow tail site, we'll kind of get into that. A snow light site is just air temp, snow depth, uh, three out of the four major parameters that we have. So precipitation, SWE, air temp. And we can toss those in just about anywhere. The big workload that we have is actually the precipitation gauge at our sites and then also when the bears tear apart our pillows. So if we can get rid of the precipitation, uh, it might be really useful for folks in these kind of settings um, just because you get snowed up we could even put load cell pillows in there and have air temperature so we could put those just about anywhere so 26 of those mostly in utah because they've been pretty progressive with automating their snow courses um, we have five data collection offices across the greater snow surveys program so that's montana idaho uh, colorado utah and oregon so between those five major data collection offices we cover all 862 of these snow tail sites uh, and then we're managed by the national water and climate center which is out in Portland, Oregon. And we'll get into how the data works, where it goes, and maybe explain some problems that you see with our data, um, maybe a little bit more in depth. But as far as our network goes here in our state, uh, we have 131 snow tail sites that we cover. Uh, that's in Montana, Wyoming, and over in the Black Hills in South Dakota. Uh, these little blue dots are snow courses that we measure on a monthly basis as well through the winter, so we stay pretty busy. Uh, we also do the Soil Climate Analysis Network, uh, or SCAN, which is kind of more ag-focused out in the plains. Uh, we have some automated precip gauges, which are just standalone. And then um, as far as our staff distribution, we have six full-time staff in the winter, and then two seasonal permanents in the summer. So staff of eight of us covers all of this um, for everybody in this area. So it's, it's a huge workload for us. I mean, we spend half of our winter planning our next summer. It's really depressing to like start talking in February about what you're going to do in September. You guys don't find that depressing. <laughs> I'm first. I knew I, I knew I was gonna have it rough, so we'll get to the fun slides, I suppose. All right, so looking at our data, um, kind of transitioning that way. Um, the data editing for our office is pretty unique. Uh, our office edits the daily data every day of the year. So that's a huge workload. If you think about looking at all the parameters that we're talking about, snow depth, precipitation, and snow water equivalent, as well as air temperature. Editing 131 sites every morning is pretty rough, like trying to go through that and make sure the data is good. And that includes when sites go down, say a pillow goes flat in the winter, we estimate those values on a daily basis using correlations. So we always have data available for our water users in our data collection office. 
And I can say with certainty that we're the only ones that do that every day. So you're pretty lucky to have what we kind of have going on here in Montana for all of our sites because how many of you have noticed that like the SWE for hourly stuff will be totally blank, but then there's a value at midnight, right? That's because we estimated that value for midnight, but you still got a value. It's a pretty good educated guess. We can use precept uh, local sites that we have to put those in. So really cool that we get that all edited every day. Hourly data though is not edited. We can't do it. The workload behind that would just be enormous. I mean, we, asked, we actually put everything on hourly polls. It used to be three hour polls in Montana. We got requests from Doug, uh, Steve over on the west side too. I'm pretty sure Stan or Eric asked us for hourly data. So we're swapping everything to hourly data. We have to do a calculation with our battery load that we have to see if we can handle that. But I think we can't. We can put more batteries in. But it's not quality controlled. We can make a lot of errors. Uh, also, if you're trying to edit daily or hourly data, because things can change so quickly that it'd just be uh, more trouble than it's worth. So when we see those missing values for the hourly data in there, um, and they, they're kind of sporadic, it happens for two or three hours, generally what happens is we have a quality control system that's kind of behind the whole setup. It's actually housed with all of our uh, servers and kind of how that works. And so if we have a decreasing value, so if a pillow decreases by an inch or two in a day, it gets flagged. So you won't see that data. That means we maybe have a puncture, something's going on, if that snow depth sensor blanks out during a storm, it gets flagged. We don't put that data out because it's bad. So we, our philosophy is it's better to put out no data than bad data because people can grab it and use it the wrong way. Um, but really, um, if it blanks out, we just want to mess with people during storms. <laughs> <laughs> Which really gets them angry too. Um, so we we're gonna actually bump everything up like 30 inches on April Fool's Day, <laughs> uh, but we didn't. <laughs> so this is a pretty common site configuration. How many of you have seen a snow hotel site? A lot of you. Oh, it's pretty surprising. I'm not some actual, not some in this group. Um, if you've ever played with them, don't ever play with this thing. Uh, this is a pillow. Conceptually, it's just a, you know what Hypalon is, raft material. It's raft material filled with antifreeze and water mixture. So it's diluted about 50-50 when it goes into that. And that gets plumbed in here with a copper line that goes into the shelter. That's a standalone precip gauge. So the standing precip gauge here um, catches solid and liquid precipitation during the summer and winter. Uh, the ground truth markers are for our verification of those points. The snow depth sensor is here on the end of this pole that uses an acoustic signal, shoots down based on the rate of return of that signal. Uh, we correct that for air temperature. We get the depth, uh, our air temperature sensor, solar panel up there, so everything's off the grid. The, our last site that we had on line power, we actually took it off line power because the Glacier National Park killed the power to it this summer, building a bathroom, so we didn't know they were doing that, but found out. Um, and so media burst is the way that we communicate as well. So um, does everybody know how we transmit data? The intricacies of meteor burst communication? No. No, all right, we'll get into that. I know you don't know that. <laughs> so the question is, you know, where are sites targeted? So we're really a water focused business. That's what we do. We do ag water forecasting, municipal water forecasting, and just macro scale water forecasting for 99 points across the state. So our sites are located in elevation bands that are basically there to produce water yield. So the alpine terrain is so variable, variable because of slope, aspect, you know, the winds, how things come in there, that it's different every year. But in the forest, it actually lays in there pretty well. So if we're targeting the shields in this, kind of in this area, we'd be targeting the shields because these sites are actually not on um, the creek coming down into Bozeman. That stuff actually flows out in the shields. This would be a good area for us to gauge the high elevation snowpack in the bridgers. So less exposure to the sun and wind in the alpine terrain. We don't want that stuff wind loading in there too badly. Uh, again, targeted for water supply forecasting and generally easy to access. So our access in Montana for our data collection office is substantially different than all the other offices. Um, the Colorado office can drive to 80% of their sites. We can drive to 30% of our sites. We ATV into about 50% of our sites and then the rest are either horseback or helicopter trips or hikes. So we have pretty complex logistical deals to, to make really with all the park service groups that we work with, Forest Service and a number of other agencies. So it's a lot of work for us to maintain these and, and really keep them running. So really, you know, again, just to emphasize it, here's Cook, here's Bozone, right? And you know, our avalanche concerns are here, but we're trying to gauge water yield here. 
So, you know, how do you extrapolate snowtail data into the alpine terrain? I think these guys do a really good job. I'm sure everybody here does. You know, you know what you got in the alpine is not what you got at the snowtail site. But it's still a pretty good proxy when you have Fisher Creek all the way up here, kind of in the headwaters, uh, right below Scotch Bonnet there. So uh, if you're going to go see the Rasta shoots, it's probably a good idea of how much load came in there. But again, not really put in for that, just a good external use. So what are our common sensors? So all of our sites have snow water equivalents, so SWE, I'll just call it that. Snow depth, precipitation, air temperature, and our 24-hour groups are air temp, maximum, and average. Then some diagnostic reports that we put out for ourselves so we can tell how our system's kind of performing. It's kind of a health check for us. Um, the 24-hour the, the groups, so the maximum and average, um, we get a lot of questions of. And one of the things that you should realize is that when you look at those daily reports, it doesn't populate the maximum and average for the day that you're looking at. And the reason is we can't total that up until midnight, right? So we're looking at 24-hour total. So that's actually the day before, right? So you're getting the day before when you're looking at that stuff. It's just something to be aware of when you're looking at those temperatures. Hourly sensors, uh, we do some enhanced sites. We put a 24-hour board in for Chelan, which they kind of automated themselves. We did that for Sylvan um, Pass Avalanche Forecasting Program as well. We also do soil moisture and temperature, RH, wind speed, wind direction, where it's applicable. Because we're down in the canopy, we're kind of in an eddy. So it's not always that relevant. We really need to get it above canopy level for that to be relevant. Uh, we can telemeter that from other areas. I've talked to Eric a little bit about that too. Uh, solar radiation, again, the 24-hour boards, and then we do 24-hour groups for RH and wind speed and wind direction. So a ton of data comes out of these. It's a really expandable system. All right, so the mechanics of how this works. I, I apologize that this is kind of like a third grade slide, but I think it shows it really well. All right, so snow accumulates, precip accumulates, and the precip gauge. So these are plumbed inside of a copper line, which is an open-ended system up this line here. So what happens when it accumulates is it puts weight down, right? So we're physically measuring the weight of the snowpack, and that weight of that fluid inside that precip gauge is then forcing the fluid through those lines and up this wall, right? So when we put that head on there, it puts it onto a pressure sensor that we have in here. So that's actually how we're getting snow water equivalent is we're taking the weight or the displacement from that weight through those lines on an open-ended system, and we measure the head by a pressure transducer. So how many people knew that's how it worked? Not many. One, Yordi does. Did she land now? Yeah, he should. He, should. <laughs> <laughs> he nodded. He nodded. He just needed to slide for a refresher. <laughs> Alright, so then what happens is we shoot a we shoot the signal down to the snow and get the depth of it and then we telemeter that out, right? So that's how it works, right? It's a really simple system. It's not overly complicated. We don't have really fancy sensors that can break going through the snowpack. There's a lot of they're coming out right now, the spa sensor, snowpack analyzer. That's great. Creep, slump, that stuff can break those things pretty easily. Uh, we're looking at a load cell to replace this. We actually purchased some of those. We'll be deploying those this summer, so it gets rid of the fluid, which is actually one of the biggest issues. Uh, and this precip gauge is also basically the reason we maintain sites on an annual basis, aside from our calibration and quality <coughs> control stuff that we do at the sites. Um, so that's, you know, that's kind of the simplicity of our system is what makes it really effective. All right, so here's how meteorverse communications work. So we had that snow tail site, which has sent that signal out. So it sends it out to the meteor region, which is about 50 miles up. So when meteors come through the atmosphere, they leave a trail of ionized gas and particulate uh, when they break up. And so uh, some smart people during the Cold War era figured out that this is a non-jammable communication technique, which means that you can't stop it, which is kind of where it came from. So the site sends a signal out and um, down to one of the two master stations we have in Dugway, Utah, or Boise, Idaho, and then it sends an acknowledgement back, and then the site sends it to the master station. So we can cover about 1,200 miles with each master station. It's a pretty unique way to get data out there. Um, it's two-way communications as well. One of the liabilities that you have with satellite communications, um, especially the GO system, is that it's one way. So we can't talk to the, the sites if we want to change stuff, but we can talk to them this way, it's small, very small packets of data, but it works really effectively. All right. so. Our sites sent the, um, the signal out. Uh, let's just say in this case it went to the Boise Master Station. So uh, once it goes from Boise, it goes to the Snowtel computer, which is located in Portland, Oregon. Uh, and that's kind of where that gets housed. 
Um, so we are the government, right? So they have enforced all these really strict rules on us about how we can host our data. So all of our servers, including our production server, the AWDB server, used to be housed in Portland, Oregon. So those have gotten moved to Kansas City. So now our data goes from Portland, the Snowtail computer, which collects all this information, and now goes to Kansas City and gets, <laughs> gets put on the internet. <laughs> Um, and so after it gets put on the internet or the production server that we have, which is what you all use to interface our data, um, that becomes available in Bozeman and for our local Sunset Magazine heroes. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't find the actual picture from Sunset Magazine. Yeah. But, okay, okay. It's a item. <laughs> so that's how it gets out there, right? One more time. That's, that's how it goes out to our system. So it goes from our sites to the master stations, to the Snowtail computer, gets put on our production server, and then gets made available, right? So it's a pretty complex system. The idea, though, is that it used to all be housed in Portland. Now it's kind of split up, which is kind of leading to some issues. And we'll get into that here in a second. I'm glad Doug has thanks to you. There's more coming, too. All right, so um, <laughs> how to impress your friends with math. So it gets referenced a lot. You know, there doesn't, there's not like a single day that Doug doesn't reference how many like tenths of an inch or inches of SWE they actually got. But if you actually want to break it down in actual load, um, we could go through like this big equation here. Uh, the average temperature or weight of water at 32 degrees Fahrenheit is 62.42 pounds per cubic foot. Cubic foot, 7.48 gallons. Uh, we could break that math out or just know that 5.2 inches so multiply by 5.2. So if we wanted to look at 100 by 100 meadow, we're basically looking at 104,000 pounds of snow for two inches of sweep, right? So if you're trying to quantify loads, that's actually why our system works is because the sweep weighs down the pillow. But you know, from the perspective of trying to relate what snow water means in terms of loads to folks, um, it's kind of a nifty tool. So 5.2, it's really easy. Forget all the other. All right, so common problems. And this is what we get a lot of questions about. We get a lot this winter. Uh, so what's wrong with snow tail? This is a pretty common one. Um, I'm sure you've seen this. The snow depth sensor blanks out like this. Um, so what's the problem? Uh, it blanks out. And the reason is because it uses a sonic or an acoustic signal to bounce down to the um, snow surface. And when you have heavy snowfall rates, about an inch, two inches an hour, which doesn't sound like that much, but if you think about trying to transmit an acoustic signal through that, it dampens it pretty heavily. And so that scatters the signal and it can't get a reading. So we're working on our, we're gonna try to work on our program to uh, make measurements a little bit more frequently towards the end of the hour so we can maybe shoot through that window where it wasn't dumping quite so much. Uh, the other one is the sensor has a 16 inch blanking height. So if that snow gets within 16 inches of that sensor, it's gonna blank out pretty much all the time. Um, so the solution really is just use SWE as a proxy, which everybody knows to do, but I just thought I'd bring it up. Um, you, can't get, um, you can't get density, but you definitely get your load out of it that way. So we can see here during this event where it blanks out, we're starting to see the snow water equivalent <coughs> ramp up on this case. So this is for black bear this year. Um, so you can definitely tell kind of what's going on. It's a better, better indicator of load. Mother Nature destroys our equipment. This is a Parker Peak in Yellowstone, so this is level. <laughs> and then this one was a new one for us too, so this is down. So if we were trying to measure the distance to that tree, we were doing it pretty effectively that year. Um, but it's really hard for us to tell in the data, which is what happens, we'll go in there and we notice that it went from 80 inches to 290 inches, whatever it inches that tree. Uh, we'll suspect the data so you won't see it, but we'll estimate it on a daily basis. <coughs> All right, so um, the problem is the SWE is not working, right? So generally that means it's a filled pressure transducer. That sensor that I showed you on the open end of that system, uh, that, those things do go bad. Uh, they're really expensive for how small they are, um, but they do go bad occasionally. We can have trees down on the sites. Um, I'm really happy Stan Bones isn't here today because I'm going to take a shot at him right here. Um, that's an avalanche approach to the pillow. Um, we asked him, you can see here we were having some snow depth issues. We were having some snow depth issues, so we asked him to go up and check on it. Um, and they went in right about here. <laughs> and uh, they, sent me, they sent me a data, he sent me an email that afternoon that said the average of 10 samples over the pillow was 240 centimeters. And so we use snow tubes, which are in English inches, 
Um, so I was wondering how in the hell he got centimeters off of the sew tubes from the ground truth. And then I started thinking, oh no, that's not good. <laughs> and I looked at the data, and sure enough, uh, the pillow went flat for the rest of the winter. <laughs> and we went back in there in the spring and verified the snow tube pun or the puncture marks on the top of the pillow. So um, that is actually not really his fault. The old pillows used to be made of metal, and he was there for a while, and he used to do that. So, um, but still, uh, they're pretty sensitive, especially that year I'd actually been up there um, earlier and there's this nasty ice crust, so I'm sure he was just trying to punch through that crust <laughs> just to get us a good measurement, and I'm sure it was just like every time, just spear in the pillow. Okay. So, <laughs> anyway, we appreciated the data, <laughs> uh, but led to some other problems for his avalanche forecasting problem for the rest of the year. Um, so the solution uh, in that case, so we'll blank these data out. If the values go bad, you can see here that the daily values are all estimated. I just wanted to highlight that to you. So the midnight values, so when I say daily values, we always edit midnight because that's the cool part of the day. So we edit from cool to cool. So the midnight values are always in there. Uh, we can use precip as a proxy, which will show you the load, but you just have to realize that it has to melt, especially when it's really cold in the winter. You know, it has to basically dilute itself into that antifreeze. So just be aware that if it is a longer lag time, or you could just use the daily sweep. All right, so um, this is that same site. Um, we have problems like this, which also occur. Um, riding up on this is never fun. We actually cut all this out during the winter too and try to get it back in, in this case. You can see here that it actually swiped the antenna off here, rotated the snow depth sensor, uh, and fell on the pillow, and killed the precip cage. So like, if you could like pick a line for like <laughs> the most damage that could possibly occur in a weather station, this tree fell there. Uh, so we do we do see a lot of problems. Precip. Uh, so precip is really useful for gauging rain on snow events, especially in the spring, even midwinter, probably west side. Um, but it can cap right. So. Um, it takes a long time for that snow to melt, um, and it can get capped by these heavy storms, generally on the west side. What we'll actually do is take this ultra shield off. This disturbs the wind, so when it comes across the surface of a can, it doesn't undercatch because wind can cause rapid, um, rapid movement of the lateral, you know, lateral force precipitation. And studies show that any standing precip gauge versus a pit gauge uh, undercatches, even with an ultra shield. And if we take that ultra shield off, to deal with this problem, we're only making our precip data worse. So if we're not getting any precip data, I'm like, hey, something's better than nothing, we'll take it off. But it, it generally generally will happen. So does everybody know what a pit gauge is? Pit gauge, you dig a hole down into the ground, right? So there's no wind interference of it. Put the precip gauges down into the ground so that basically you're catching whatever hits at the ground surface, right? So what other tool do we have at a snow tell site which is like that? The pillow, right? The pillow is basically like a huge pit gauge in the middle of the winter, right? If you think of it conceptually. So it's going to catch more, which also means that it increments at different rates than the precip gauge does. So here's another problem that we have. Um, the suggested, this is the 404 directory not found. Um, so this is when our, our uh, master stations go down, um, which is what happened in December. So we had one master station go down. As soon as we got that one up, the other master station went down. Uh, right before Christmas, too, and right during a huge storm cycle. It always happens, two years in a row. Uh, and then some server issues here. So if you see this, um, this was a suggested problem, is that snow tail sites in southwest Montana are not working, which impedes our ability to report snowfall amounts. Uh, NRCS is working hard to fix this issue, too. That was in the advisory from December 16th until the 21st. And, and I didn't know, I mean, I, we, knew you, we knew you weren't working very hard, but I put that in there and made it Good to clear. Good to clear. Great. So, um, I would argue that our sites actually were working. They were transmitting data out, it just wasn't getting caught. So, from our end, um, we, so our managing group in Portland, they work on the master station, so that's kind of why I'm tying into this is they work on the master stations in Boise and um, Dugway. So they were responsible for getting out there and doing that because they have all the equipment to maintain it. So when that happens for us in the offices, we're kind of just, I mean, we're up a creek, right? We don't get any data. We don't know what to do. We can try to offer to send employees to go help them. Uh, there's, but there's very little we can do aside from that. And now we have another problem, which is that our server is housed in Kansas City, which means when we have outages there, you can also see these similar issues. 
So um, just due to the age of those meteor bursts, is, go ahead, Eric. You're your hand. I was just going to ask is, how do you know where, which station is goes to which master station? That's a good question. So in our diagnostics reports, uh, the group 16 stuff that comes out, it tells us what, how many um, acts it gets from each master station, so we can see where we're at. And in southwest Montana, if the Boise master station goes down, we're hosed. Right? Like our sites only transmit to that Boise master station, even though we point in the middle of two of them. But for you, if the Dugway master station goes down, you're hosed. Right? So it's a function of distance there. And if you ever have questions, just ask us. We can tell you kind of what the story is. So just due to the age of it, we're trying to upgrade all those. They need new um, amplifiers to go into it. It's a ton of power that you have to have to get these signals coming in. And then also just the government policy dictated we move our server to a secure location at um, NITSE in Kansas City, so we no longer have physical access to our servers. So now we have to call somebody on the phone in Kansas and say, hey, listen, I think this is going wrong. Can you reset the server for us? And they say, okay, we'll try to figure it out. And then uh, you guys work for ski areas. How awesome is IT in your ski area? Sweet. Yeah, ours is, it's not fast. So we try to solve the problems, but in general, our sites are actually always communicating. It's just some of these problems that lead to not getting to be out. So right now, use the link at the top of the screen. Uh, this just got built, too. Uh, we made sure to put this in when our servers got put there in case, I mean, you guys are up at 5 looking at this data, 4 or 5 in the morning. So if you see it, there's actually a help button at the top. That might notify them that there's a problem before we even get to the office. So if you see that, send them a link. Uh, we're also looking at migrating our problems to or our program <laughs> uh, to a new communication system. So there are cellular towers. There's actually more going in Montana. We, we're actually figured out how many is it, Eric? Over 40 sites we can put. Yeah, about 40. Right yeah, about 40 sites we could use a cell modem, which gives us rapid two-way communications. Really cool. Uh, <coughs> takes us off a meteor system, and then satellite, which is actually really expensive, and um, also one-way communications for now. But mostly just. Ask the snow staff to craft a statement for the advisory, uh, which equals less angry emails from ski bums. Because we always get one from like Powder Junkie 101 that's like, get off your lazy asses and go fix the site. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not kidding. We get a lot of angry emails about this stuff. Um, and I have a diagram of kind of generally how this works, too. So uh, this is our snow survey office here. Uh, we're just a kind of a happy group. And then, the <laughs> avalanche center comes down the hall. Uh, and then the emperor shows up. Good <laughs> morning. I had to get you laughing somehow. Um, they're actually really nice about it, but um, it kind of illustrates how the importance of our data going out to these recreational groups, and we're aware of it. You know, it's not our definitely our our biggest focus because we do have our other jobs uh, in terms of ag forecasting, but we, we always make sure our sites are up. We work really hard at it. So, in terms of data analysis, um, some pretty nifty tools are coming on the interactive map, the snowpack trend graphs. Uh, I basically reworked our whole website, or at least parts of it where you can actually use a smartphone to look at our data because we don't have developers just making a smartphone compatible version of our websites just because of compliance issues in the government. Uh, and then some historical data products that I've kind of put out there. So um, how many people use this to get to the data now? A couple of you. I would argue that this is probably going to be the most powerful tool that we have um, to show folks uh, in a little bit. How am I doing on time? You're about half hour. Okay, am I over? Not yet. You want me to? You want me to get into this? Yeah, you're over. No. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So this is a beta testing version of this. Um, I'd probably be happy to share it with some people in this group. Maybe I'll open. Um, <coughs> kick over at some point. Do this. Well, I was hoping that I would, I'd be able to do it. But um, basically, I, I guess I'll just walk through it verbally. Um, this is a beta testing version of it. This is our new interactive map. It replaces uh, the old static maps where you clicked on a point, went to the site page, had your option of parameters. Um, this is the 
the latest and greatest version of this. We're always refining this and working really hard on it. So we're going to be able to do um, basically deltas. So if you want to get on there in the morning and have a map of how much you got in terms of load, that'll be time selectable. Um, so if you want to know what your sweet delta was for 24 hours, one week, one month, all those things, right? So just how much sweet you've actually gotten. I saw that they put together a summary of the March Madness snowfall on the advisory. They could have just got on here and seen 6.2 inches in shower, right? Without having to go through like the whole daily data. So uh, it's kind of a USA Today gener generation that we live in. So putting so like spatial data out like this is great because it gets people to re like rapidly process it. So also peaks. Um, this is a really powerful tool, and it leads you. It can lead you into like the, the same dark hole of data analysis that you do like on YouTube. You know, you watch one video on YouTube, and then you end up watching the PBR video. <laughs> um, but you can find a lot of really cool data. It's it's a direct portal to our site. Um, and the one thing that I'm not sure a lot of people realize is that the report generator that you use that actually generates those reports, this map, everything that you do is coded in the URL, right? So if you bookmark that, this view, these sites that you've selected, the parameters, the metric that you choose up here, that is all bookmarked in that URL. So if you bookmark that on your computer, you don't have to rebuild that again. It'll take you directly to it, which is really cool because you don't want to look at everything all the time. You're just looking at these sites down here on the Gallatin. If you bookmark that view, it'll just go right back to it, which is really slick. Our trend graphs, does anybody look at these just to see where we're at snowpack wise? Uh, these are automated now, so they run daily. They used to be weekly. Uh, we have an automated process which runs these now, so every day these update for all the major river basins and even some, some sub basins too. We can always build custom reports for you if you need them. But really useful tool to keep track of where we're at. So as you can see here, we're right at normal for the Gallatin this year, which is in defiance of El Nino, which is awesome. And um, yeah, so we have a good amount of information out there to you. And then one thing that we kind of got, well, I use this quite a bit myself when I'm traveling on the road just to see if the site that I was working on is still working after I left it. Um, if you go to this current water year tab from our main page, it'll bring you to this one. And you can basically select all this stuff on your smartphone and look through the data. So you can scroll to it pretty quickly. And I've actually formatted it. There's a bunch of buttons you can click within the report generator. but if you use this to get to the data, you can look at it on your smartphone. And it won't be crazy, so. Can I ask you a question about the interactive map and more about some of the data that comes out when you click on just, I don't know, the box that pops up on each individual site. There's a couple columns now. And one of them refers to period of record median, so one of it refers to actual median, and then there's a period of record average. Mm -hmm. Can you maybe quickly or briefly explain and it's simple terms what the difference between those three values might be from a practitioner standpoint yeah um, Shalane knows me well enough to tell me to be short and simple so um, basically um, that we use a normal so we generate a normal for climate basically a lot of weather folks use a 30-year normal period because that most closely represents uh, the climate that you're basically you've been seeing over the last 30 years um, so we generate a 1981 to 2010 normal. So the official one is from 1981 to 2010. So it doesn't include 2011, 2012, 13, 14, 15, right? We're in the 16 water year this year. Um, so if you use the, the official one, you're comparing to that. But there's some of us within the program that think that it's a little bit um, climatically naive or maybe even wrong to just use that and to have that as a reference. So the period of record is actually the entire period of record for that site. It's not defined just in 1981. So for example, if you looked at Lick Creek, um, it would go back, to, it would be the analysis all the way back to 1965 to current. So you'd be looking at 50 years of data versus that one 30 year period. <coughs> but a lot of the sites say went in in 1992. So your period of record versus your actual might be the same. Close, except you wouldn't be considering 11 and, 11 and 14 in terms of big years, right? So period of record goes from the beginning to the end, right? And if you actually click, it'll tell you how many years of record you're looking at. It'll say 38 years of record. Or six period years. of record would be the most thorough. Yeah, that would be the data collection. Correct. Yep. Yeah. So we just made that available to people. Oh. Yep. Uh, and so the difference between a median and an average, an average, you take all the numbers, add them up, and divide it by the total number of numbers you used. Um, the median is just the midpoint between 
the high and the low, right? Does that make sense? Simple enough? Should have left the fun slides for the end, but I didn't. Um, any other questions about our data that I can answer? Weird stuff that you noticed? Question. How often do you think the precip gauges get bridged over by the bridge? So. Um, in this in this area, it's really just the big loads that we we see that right. So Black Bear down out of West Yellowstone, that'll do it. Uh, generally, like the colder the colder climates, like the higher elevation, we see less of that except during big storm events, and they generally will drop uh, drop in. But it's mostly a west side problem, to be honest. And so the Northwest, we see a lot of it, to be honest. And we've taken a lot of those ultra shields off, which has kind of compromised our precip data. But we'd rather get some data than no data. Um, but we do, uh, so if you see the, the values suspected for precip in the northwest or in the middle of the winter, that either means the transducer is dead or it's capped. So we just do the daily increments off of the pillow. Lucas, do you, you mention a problem with, in terms of um, the actual snow depth sensor uh, having issues during like peak snow precip events, but I think I was talking a couple weeks ago and you mentioned maybe if the SWE, if we're seeing snow depth go up, but SWE not change, being a function of maybe an ice lens or some other type of, um, can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, Alex, um, so we're measuring weight, right? So as we all know, there's layers in the snowpack, right? And we can have bridging, especially when we have like ice layers inside of our snowpack and definitely depends on the topography that you have there we're trying to measure weight over a certain area. So um, there is the possibility, and we've seen that, where we're not seeing load applied to the pillow. And this especially happens when you get into um, some melt-free cycles, or if you get into an early thaw like we had last year. We put a lot of uh, snow water into the snowpack like midwinter, and then we kind of see stuff later in the winter where um, if you think about an ice lens, it can actually bridge over a pretty large spatial area. And so we wouldn't see the load applied to that pillow because of that. Um, but in the spring, what ends up happening is as the all water moves through that, that lens breaks down and then we see a rapid load of that um, SWE onto the pillow. And so from our perspective, in the term, like, terms of like total water, um, it's not as big of a deal as like an operational program that's looking at that from like a daily, on a daily basis. Um, so you just have to be a little bit more, uh, you have to recognize that that's a possibility. Yeah. Yeah, it's not all that common. We, we generally are pretty good about picking our sites, but there's a configuration of some sites that, you know, that could certainly, you know, impact the pillow. You know, the more slope that you have, uh, we generally will dig out a flat platform, and so you have like a high wall, and so when you have that moving across, you have that lateral flow and the snow water through it, and especially if that freezes, um, you can definitely have some bridging issues of those pillows. More questions? All right, I'm Thanks. done.